Today we're going to look at chapter 5, which is over the integumentary system. The integumentary system includes not only the epidermis and dermis, or what you may think of as the skin itself, but also all of its appendages, such as hair follicles, nails, sweat glands, blood vessels. So we're going to be looking at not only what the integumentary system consists of, but also evaluating the injuries that the integumentary system can go through, such as burns, but we'll also look at skin cancer. The skin itself consists of two distinct regions. You have an upper or superficial epidermis, which is made up of epithelial tissue. Remember from chapter four that epithelial tissue is avascular. And then under the epidermis, which is epithelial tissue, is going to be connective tissue, mainly fibrous connective tissue. And this is the tissue that contains blood vessels, therefore it is vascular, and it's going to be able to give nutrients to the epidermis via diffusion. Under the epidermis and dermis, so deep to the skin, would be the subcutaneous tissue. It's also known as the hypodermis and is made up mainly of adipose tissue. It's able to absorb shock and insulate, but it's also mainly there to attach the skin to underlying structures like muscles. You can see in this basic figure of skin structure that the epidermis, which is going to be stratified squamous epithelium, is superficial to the dermis and that the dermis is much thicker than the epidermis. And then we have a layer of subcutaneous tissue made up of fat that is below the skin. Also notice that a lot of the stuff that's in skin is in the dermis. We have different nervous structures and also different appendages of the skin. All of those are found mainly within the dermis. So let's talk about the epidermis first. It's smaller, there's not as much in it but we do wanna talk about the different types of cells you can find making up the epidermis. So the epidermis is stratified squamous epithelium. It's keratinized stratified squamous epithelium, meaning that the top layer of cells are not only keratinocytes, but they are also dead cells. So it's just a layer of keratin because the living component of the cell is no longer intact. There are four cell types found in the epidermis. You have the keratinocytes. This is the main or major cell type of the epidermis, are the keratinocytes, and they produce keratin. Now, that is what's going to give skin its protective properties. It's very resilient protein. And we're going to see that the keratinocytes are gonna be tightly connected by desmosomes. The cells of the epidermis are going to be in sheets, and these desmosomes not only attach the adjacent cells together, but allow for some give so that when you scratch your skin, when you scratch the epidermis, it doesn't just shear off your body, it doesn't just shred. And millions of keratinocytes actually slough off every day. And again, this isn't tearing the entire epidermis or integument because we have those tightly connected desmosomes and they deteriorate as we move from the bottom of the epidermis upwards. And we'll see what I mean by bottom upwards of the epidermis. Another cell type is the melanocytes. These are spider-shaped cells located in the deepest epidermis. They produce the pigment melanin, and melanin is packaged into melanosomes. So melanosomes are gonna be able to be transferred to keratinocytes, and the reason that melanin is useful in cells like keratinocytes is they protect the nucleus from UV damage. So the more melanin that the keratinocytes are able to take in, the more protection they have against UV damage. And UV damage can cause cancer, so it's important that there, this protection exists. Another cell type is the dendritic or Langerhans cells. They're very star-shaped. They have a lot of extensions. They're basically modified macrophages. They're able to patrol the deep layers of the epidermis, so around that basal layer, and they're gonna be key activators of the immune system. So you'll hear more about them when you get to AMP2 and talk about the immune system, but dendritic cells are a main immune cell located in the bottom of the epidermis. And then you have the tactile or Merkel cells, which are going to be nervous sensory receptors, and they're able to sense touch, things like light touch or vibration. So next we're gonna go through the layers of the epidermis. Keep in mind, we're gonna see those four cell types as we go through the layers. We'll be looking at thick skin, but there is something called thin skin as well. So thick skin contains five strata or five layers, and it's going to be the most applicable for high abrasion areas. So for example, your hands or on your feet, but most of the body actually contains thin skin, which contains only four layers or four strata.
But since we want to make sure we learn all of them, we'll look at five layers first. But again, just keep in mind, thick skin contains five, thin skin contains four. And the layer missing in thin skin is going to be the stratum lucidum. So that's an important point. The five layers of the epidermis, starting from the bottom and moving upwards, are stratum basal, stratum spinosum, stratum granulosum, stratum lucidum, and stratum corneum. So stratum basal is the bottom layer. You can think of it as the basal layer. It's the deepest layer if we compared it to the top corneal layer. It's going to look a lot more cell-like. The corneal layer, as opposed to the basal layer, would consist of mainly dead cells. However, the stratum basal consists of living cells. It's a layer firmly attached to the layer under the epidermis, which is the dermis. And it even contains stem cells. That means that cells in this layer are actively mitotic. They can divide. We can produce more cells. We can produce daughter cells. And these are the cells that get added to the epidermis, which needs to occur because, again, the very top layer of the epidermis has cells that are sloughed off every day. So you have one daughter cell from the actively mitotic stem cells in this basal layer journey from this basal layer to the surface about every 25 to 45 days. And as cells move from this basal layer upwards, they're going to die because they get too far from the blood vessels in the dermis. They get too far from the nutrients. One of the daughter cells created by the actively mitotic and dividing stem cells is actually going to stay near the stratum basal and continue to be a stem cell. We could also call the stratum basal the stratum germinativum. This term comes from the fact that these cells in this layer, some of which are actively mitotic, can perform mitosis, so they can germinate. And only about 10 to 25 percent of this layer is composed of melanocytes, but what you can find in the stratum basal is stem cells that can perform mitosis and melanocytes. Next, let's move upward. So we're moving from the bottom layer to the layer right above it, and we're moving to the stratum spinosum. So it's called the prickly layer because even though it's several le levels or layers thick, the cells are going to contain intermediate pre-keratin fibers that attach to desmosomes. This attachment from inside to outside the cell gives them a spiky appearance, hence it being called the prickly layer. The keratinocytes, again, in this layer appear spiky as they attach to those intermediate pre-keratin filaments, and we're going to find the intermediate pre-keratin filaments scattered among the keratinocytes, and they're also going to see or be next to abundant melanosomes and dendritic cells that are in this layer. Moving upward, so away from basal, away from our prickly layer, we're moving into granulosum. This is essentially the granular layer, so the cells contain granules. So it's four to six cell layers thick, but the cells are flattened, so we're starting to see that squamous shape as we move away from the basal layer. And the cell appearance is going to change even more so from that prickly layer. Not only are the cells flattening, their nuclei and organelle, organelles are starting to disintegrate. The cells are starting to die, but they are accumulating keratin as they move closer to the corneal layer. They accumulate keratohyalin granules. They also accumulate lamellar granules. The keratohyalin granules are going to help form keratin fibers once the cells move up even further, closer to that superficial corneal layer, whereas the lamellar granules are going to be a water-resistant glycolipid that slows water loss and is especially notable in stratum lucidum as we move upwards. This is going to be the last layer of living cells. So stratum basal, stratum spinosum, stratum granulosum, all three of those layers contain living cells. After we leave this layer, cells above this layer die because they're too far from the dermal capillaries to survive. So that leads us to stratum lucidum. Again, this is the layer only found in thick skin, so it's missing in thin skin. It's a very thin layer. It's translucent, so that's where lucidum is coming from. And the cells are definitely squamous shaped by this point, but they're dead keratinocytes because granulosum was the last living cell layer. We're going to see that this cell lies on top of stratum granulosum, but under stratum corneum. And stratum corneum is also called the horny layer, but this is going to be one of the thickest layers of the epidermis. 20 to 30 rows of squamous or flat anucleated, 
a nucleated keratinized dead cell. So you're going to have a lot of rows of dead cells that are missing their nucleus because they've degenerated. What's going to be left over is pre-keratin and keratin fibers. And all of these cells together, if we count stratum corneum, actually accounts for three quarters of epidermal thickness. So the other layers are definitely not as thick as stratum corneum. Even though the cells are dead, they're definitely still going to have a function related to the integument. It's a very protective layer. So we're protecting the deeper cells that are living from anything that is abrasive or could injure the superficial environment. Thankfully, the lamellar granules are still going to be intact and they can prevent water loss. And essentially, especially when you get to the immune system, you're going to see that the layers of the epidermis, especially this top thick stratum corneum or horny layer, is able to act just as a barrier, a physiological barrier. It also has some chemical and other things that it can do in order to assault things like pathogens and prevent anything from getting deeper into the body. Now, still looking at the layers of the epidermis, the cells that are sloughed off are actually going to be slightly changed because they go through apoptosis or controlled cell death. And so the cells that are being sloughed off are truly dead. They're not hanging on and slightly alive. They're part of that stratum corneal, corneal layer. And not only has their nucleus degenerated, but a lot of their organelles have as well. So this breakdown of cellular components is going to be initiated through apoptosis, or again, controlled cell death. So the dead cells that slough off as dandruff and dander have gone through apoptosis. And we actually shed about 50,000 cells every minute. So let's take a minute and kind of review. Let's talk about the layers of the epidermis. Starting at the bottom, we have stratum basal. This is where the mitotic cells are. This layer could also be called stratum germinativum. Moving upwards, we have stratum spinosum, also known as the prickly layer. This is where we have a lot of cells and we start to see not only their intermediate keratin fibers, but also the intermediate filaments that are attached to desmosomes. So we start to see those filaments kind of attach themselves to other filaments in other adjacent cells, hence the prickly appearance to these cells. Then you have stratum granulosum, where the cells are starting to flatten a little bit more, but the organelles are starting to deteriorate, the cytoplasm and the other parts of the cell are starting to break down because the cell is moving further and further away from nutrients. The cells though in stratum granulosum, spinosum, and basal are not dead, but as you move up, if we were looking at thick skin, we would see stratum lucidum and then stratum corneum. Those two layers are dead. So in this image, we are looking at thin skin because we're missing stratum lucidum, and that is missing in thin skin. Other cells that you can see in these layers, you can see melanocytes in the basal layer. Some dendritic cells, but dendritic cells are a lot more common in stratum spinosum. And then you'll start to see a lack of nuclei as we move upwards and closer to stratum corneum, which is the most superficial layer. It makes up most of the epidermis. So that's it for the epidermis right this minute. Let's move on to the dermis, which is connective tissue. So epidermis, epithelial tissue, dermis, connective tissue. So make sure you have that association correct. The dermis is going to contain a lot of strong, flexible connective tissue fibers. It contains fibroblasts of connective tissue proper, macrophages, sometimes mast cells and white blood cells. So a lot of times in the dermis, or at least part of the dermis, you'll find areolar connective tissue because those are also all components of areolar connective tissue. And we find under all epithelial sheets, areolar connective tissue. And the fibers of this type of tissue in its matrix are able to bind essentially the body together. It makes up what you may have think of as the hide of animals, but also humans. It's going to attach to the subcutaneous tissue, which attaches to muscle. And this is where a lot of the stuff of the skin resides, the nerves, the blood vessels, the lymphatic vessels. You also find hair follicles, especially the roots, and then parts of oil glands and the sweat glands. So more on that in just a moment, but let's talk about the structure of the dermis. Not only is it connective tissue, it has two layers. It has the papillary layer and the reticular layer. So here we can see a picture where we have the epidermis, 
and then under it is the dermis. So that would be this entire portion here. The papillary dermis or the papillary layer is superficial to the reticular layer. And the papillary layer sits just under stratum basal, which is not straight across, it's wavy as a layer. And it consists of areolar connected tissue, which should make sense from chapter four because they're under all epithelial sheets is areolar connective tissue. It has a cushioning property. Then under the papillary layer is the reticular dermis, and it's the most fibrous of the parts of the dermis, so it's made up of dense irregular connective tissue. So let's look at both layers. Let's look at the papillary layer, which is superficial to the reticular. It's smaller than the reticular layer, made up of areolar connective tissue. So it contains things like collagen and elastic fibers, even a little bit of reticular fibers, but it contains all three fiber types. On these fiber types are things like phagocytes. There's also mast cells and fibroblasts, but there are also dermal papillae, which are the superficial regions of the dermis, so of the papillary layer, that actually send finger-like projections up into the epidermis in certain locations like that around your toes and around your fingers, especially the ends of your fingers. So these dermal papillae in certain regions actually form things that you're familiar with, like your fingerprints or your toe prints. But in other areas, these dermal papillae are just project projections that contain blood vessels. The blood vessels are called capillary loops. Sometimes there's also free ner nerve endings just under the basal layer in these dermal papillae and some touch receptors. In thick skin, again, the dermal papillae are going to lie on top of dermal ridges, and that creates ridges in the epidermis. And the ridges in the epidermis created by dermal or thick dermal papillae are known as friction ridges. And they're your fingerprints and toe prints, and they enhance the gripping ability. They definitely help with sense of touch. And there's also some sweat pores in the ridges, and that would leave a unique fingerprint pattern for each individual. So here in this image, you can see the friction ridges. The friction ridges are created by thick dermal papillae, but they cause ridges in the epidermis. So we have epidermal ridges that lie on top of dermal ridges. And you can also see the tiny sweat duct openings. So those would be in the crest at the tops of the epidermal ridges formed by the dermal papillae ridges. Next, we're going to look at the reticular layer. The reticular layer makes up most of the dermis, so about 80% of dermal thickness. It contains not areolar connective tissue, but instead dense fibrous connective tissue, mainly irregular fibrous connective tissue. It also has much more fibers, so it has more elastic fibers, it has collagen fibers, even has those reticular fibers, hence its name. And because we have collagenous fibers, we're able to keep the skin hydrated and bind water. So the reticular layer is important for skin hydration. Also inside the reticular layer is the cutaneous. So while the capillary loops go up into those dermal ridges, the networks that send capillary loops upwards are the cutaneous plexi. And that's a true network kind of branching of blood vessels that are located between the reticular layer and the subcutaneous area or the hypodermis. And then extracellular matrix of the reticular layer contains some pockets of adipose cells, but most of the adipose cells are going to be found under the skin, so under the epidermis and dermis in that subcutaneous hypodermal area. There's also cleavage or tension lines in the reticular layer, and this would be caused by collagen fibers running in a similar direction in the skin surface. Externally, these are completely invisible. But cleavage or tension lines are important for surgeons, so they're important for doctors, because if you make an incision parallel to a cleavage line, it would cause an injury or a cut, a laceration, say, to heal more readily and more cleanly. So here is a graph showing you the cleavage lines in the human body. And again, they're just representing different kind of underlying collagen fiber bundles and how they're separated throughout the reticular dermis. You can see how in certain areas they run circular around the trunk and then longitudinally in other areas like the limbs. And again, it's great if surgeons know about these so that they can follow the lines and make sure that healing is better than if it would be if we made a cut or they made a cut 
across or against these cleavage lines. So the flexural lines of the rotibo layer are just dermal folds at or near joints. These would be areas where the dermis is really tightly secured to deeper structures. They would allow the skin to not really slide past these areas, and that's to make sure that joints move, but unfortunately that causes deep creases in the skin at these flexure lines. You can actually see flexure lines, whereas if we go back, you can't see cleavage lines. So this tight attachment actually forms things we can see all the way up through the epidermis. For example, you can see lines on your hands, around your wrists, your fingers, on the soles, and on your toes. So here are examples of some of those flexure lines. Again, it's just where the dermis is really closely attached to underlying structures to make sure that the joints can move freely, but that means the skin doesn't need to slip and slide past. We can also talk about homeostatic imbalance. So there, if you stretch your skin extremely, it could be caused by weight or other reasons. So pregnancy is one reason that could form these things called striae or extreme stretching of the skin. This type of stretching which produces these white scars called striae are just dermal tears. They can be kind of silvery in appearance and they're known as stretch marks. Now acute short-term traumas can actually cause striae but we can also see that other short-term traumas cause blisters. And blisters are something we're going to talk about more when we get to burns. And blisters are going to be fluid-filled pockets that separate the epidermal and dermal layers. So these are just two homeostatic balances. So formation of dermal tears called striae, you know them as stretch marks, or the formation of blisters that can occur in the integument. So here's just a picture of the striae. And next we're going to move on and talk about the three pigments that contribute to skin color. The first one would be melanin. This is the only pigment that's actually made in the skin. The other pigments we're going to talk about are not made in the skin. This pigment, melanin, is made by melanocytes. It's also similar to the amino acid tyrosine and tyrosinase from which it's made. We package melanin into vesicles called melanosomes. And we can actually send melanosomes from melanocytes to keratinocytes. And so that gives the keratinocytes this pigment that can protect them from UV sunlight. So the more sun someone experiences, the more need for the protective shield, so the more melanin will be produced. And everyone has the same number of melanocytes, but their melanocytes produce different numbers of melanosomes containing different amounts of melanin. There's two different forms of melanin. So there's reddish yellow and brownish black, and that accounts for skin color differences and how much melanin also accounts for skin color differences. The more melanin that you have in your keratinocytes, the more protection you have against UV radiation. So that means the more protection you have against possibly DNA damaging UV radiation that can cause mutations that lead to cancer formation. There's also freckles and pigmented moles that are just local accumulations of melanin. So excessive sun exposure damages skin. Skin cancer is a very real and dangerous homeostatic imbalance. The reason that excessive sun exposure damages skin is because it causes mutations in the DNA, but it also causes elastic fibers to clump, which makes the skin become leathery. It can depress the immune system by affecting the position or the amount of dendritic cells in the epidermis. Again, I've mentioned multiple times that it can cause alterations in DNA that can lead to skin cancer. But it also destroys things like folic acid, which are needed for DNA synthesis, so for any fixing of that mutated DNA. So if you damage DNA and then get rid of folic acid and impair DNA synthesis, you can lead to dangerous development of skin cancers, but you can also impede embryo development. Photosensitivity is also, incre also an increased reaction to the sun which some individuals experience. Photosensitivity is usually caused by some drugs, usually prescription drugs like antibiotics, antihistamines. Perfumes can cause photosensitivity if you overly use perfumes on your skin or if you overly use perfumed lotion. This can lead to skin rashes if someone were to 
use a lot of perfume or a lot of perfume lotion and then go lay out in the sun to tan. Besides me melanin, there's also carotene and hemoglobin. So carotene is yellow to orange pigment. Think carrots when you think carotene. And you would see this in the palms and the soles. So if for some reason you suddenly decided you wanted to eat a lot of carrots and you ate a bowl of carrots every day for two or three weeks. You may actually see your palms and the soles of your feet turn orange because that pigment can accumulate in thick skin. Carotene though is important because it can be converted to vitamin A and vitamin A is important for vision. It's important in the rods for vision, so for peripheral or grayscale color versus color vision, but it's also important for epidermal health. Then there's hemoglobin. So hemoglobin is a pinkish hue. Hemoglobin is going to be a pigment found in a protein that's inside red blood cells. So if someone has fair skin and they were to blush, meaning blood rush to the capillary loops just under their cheeks, they would turn slightly pink because of the pinkish hue of hemoglobin in those red blood cells. And the skin of really pale Caucasians are more tra transparent. So that's why the color of hemoglobin shows through in such individuals. And then other alterations in skin color can indicate disease. So different colors to the skin is not always something due to a pigment, but a color change can be indicative of an imbalance. So cyanosis is a blue skin color. This blue skin color is not created because of a pigment, it's created because of low oxygenation of tissues due to low oxygenation of hemoglobin. There's also pallor, which is a really pale color to the skin. This could be due to anemia, usually iron deficiency anemia, or if someone has low blood pressure, or they're angry, or they're fearing something, something scared them. There's also erythema, so like erythrocytes is another name for red blood cells, Erythema is another name for redness to the skin. So fever, high blood pressure, inflammation, allergy, all of these can cause a red tint or red cast to the skin. And then you have a yellow cast called jaundice, which is usually something that develops in mucous membranes like that of the eyes or near the nail beds. And this is usually due to liver disorders. Then there's bruises. Bruises are black and blue marks and they're going to be accumulations of blood. And as the clotted blood beneath the skin, also called a hematoma or ecchymosis, is broken down, the color of the bruise will change, usually from that black and blue color into kind of a brown and then moving into a yellow. Then you have brown or black necklace of bruises, which this is a hyperpigmentated dark area around sometimes the armpits or around the neck. And this type of necklace bruise is usually a sign of insulin resistance and elevated blood glucose levels. Next, we're gonna move on and look at hair. So hair consists of just dead keratinized cells. It generally has kind of a center region that has a couple of living cells, but usually the cells that are living are more likely to be found in the roots. And we're not gonna see any hair on the palms, the soles of your feet, both those locations have thick skin, but it's also not found on the lips, the nipples, or portions of the external genitalia. The reason that hair is important to the integument is it's going to be able to protect from heat loss and shield the skin from sunlight, but it's also going to be able to warn of insects on the skin because of its sensory capabilities. You could also call hairs pili, and again, they're just mainly dead keratinized cells, just strands of those dead keratinocytes. They are, though, produced by hair follicles, which contain things like the hair root, which contains mitotic or living cells. Hairs or pili contain hard keratin, and that's going to be different than the soft keratin that's found in your skin. Hard keratin is definitely tougher, hence its name, it's more durable, and these cells would not slough or flake off. There's different regions of hair. There's the shaft and the root. The shaft is the portion that you can see, so it's the area that extends above the scalp where the keratinization is complete. The root is going to be the area within the scalp, and that's where the keratinization is still going on. So you can see the shaft, the root is within the scalp, you cannot see that portion. 
There's three parts of the hair shaft. You have the medulla, the cortex, the cuticle. The medulla mainly is going to be not only in the middle, but it contains really large cells, some air spaces, as opposed to the cortex, which contains several layers of flattened cells surrounding the medulla. The cuticle is the most outer part or superficial portion of the structure of a hair follicle. And this outer layer consists of overlapping layers and kind of like shingles on a roof. And these overlapping layers of single cells are going to form a protective layer around the cortex and the medulla. Different hair pigments are also made by melanocytes. These melanocytes would reside in hair follicles instead of the skin. The combination of the different melanins, so yellow, rust colored, brown, black, they create all of the hair colors. Red hair is going to also have pheomelanin as a pigment in it, as opposed to hair that's not red, which would be missing the pheomelanin pigment. And then gray and white hair results when the melanin production decreases as you age. And air bubbles, especially that in the medulla, would replace the melanin in the shaft. So let's look at the structure of hair and its follicle. So you can see the follicle wall, which consists of the peripheral connective tissue or fiber sheath that surrounds the hair follicle, a glassy membrane in the epithelial root sheath, and the epithelial root sheath contains an external and internal portion. Next, we can see the hair. The cuticle is protective. The cortex is made up of a couple layers of cells, and the medulla is mostly empty space, contains large cells, if any. So these are both cross sections of hair within its follicle, and the one on the right is the photomicrograph of an actual cross section of a slide taken from a sample. So let's go more into the structure of a hair follicle now that we've seen those images. So the hair follicle itself extends from the epidermal surface to the dermis. The hair bulb is the expanded area at the deep end of the follicle. And the hair follicle receptor is going to be a sensory nerve ending that wraps itself around the hair bulb. So I'll point that out. So hair is considered a sensory touch receptor because of this hair follicle receptor, receptor wrapped around the hair bulb. Another name for the hair follicle receptor is the root hair plexus. And as we move and look at the rest of the hair follicle, the wall of the follicle itself is composed of that peripheral connective tissue sheath I pointed out. That's similar to the dermis, so it's derived from connective tissue. That's why it's also called the fiber sheath, because you also find the dermis fibrous connective tissue. Then you have a thickened basal lamina of the peripheral connective tissue sheath that's separate from the dermal derived layer, but right next to it. Then you have the epithelial root sheath, which is derived from the epidermis. The hair matrix is going to be found in the hair bulb. It produces hair cells. In the hair matrix, you have cells that produce new cells, so you have mitotic cells. Attached to the hair follicle is an erector pili. This is a muscle, it's smooth muscle, and it's attached not only to the follicle, but to some connective tissue, and it's responsible for making the hair rise or producing goosebumps. Then you have hair papilla, which is dermal tissue that contain a knot of capillaries, and that is what supplies nutrients to growing hair. A hair papilla is usually found under the hair bulb. It's a tiny projection of connective tissue that goes up into the hair bulb, and again, that is where you find capillary loops like that of the papilla in the papillary layer of the dermis. So that's where you find nutrients being provided to the epithelial portions of hair follicles because epithelial tissue does not have blood vessels, connective tissue does, so epithelial tissue must get its nutrients via diffusion from connective tissue. So here is the hair papilla, which would contain blood vessels. Around it you have some melanocytes, the hair follicle itself, the bottom is sitting on some subcutaneous adipose or fat tissue. As the hair follicle moves up, you can see that we have the large kind of air-filled space that is the cortex, the medulla with a couple layers of cells surrounding it. And then you have on the outside the cuticle. The cuticle is really just a single layer of cells protecting those inner three layers. Then surrounding that, you're going to have the epithelial layers, the external and internal root sheath, then the glassy membrane, and then the peripheral connective tissue. So you're going to have that dermal-derived tissue. 
So we start with the three layers of the hair root, then we have more epidermal-like cells, and then you have connective tissue-like cells. There's different types of hair and different types of hair growth. There's vellus hair, which is pale fine body hair of children and adult females. It might be something you call baby fuzz or baby hair. Then the terminal hair is the hair you're used to that is very long, possibly coarse hair, found on the scalp, making up your eyebrows. At puberty, it would appear in your armpits and the pubic regions of both sexes. It's also found on the faces and necks of males. And different nutrition or hormone abundances or lack thereof can affect your hair growth because there is a cycle of follicle growth between and it goes back and forth between active and regressive phases. So average hair growth is about 2.25 millimeters of growth per week. And on average, someone would lose about 90 scalp hairs daily. There is a homeostatic imbalance that can cause the production of abnormally large amounts of androgens in women. So in women, when their ovaries and their adrenal glands produce small amounts of these androgens, which are male sex hormones, similar to testosterone, then they can experience polycystic ovary syndrome. Sometimes these organs would have benign tumors on them, and that's what causes this abnormally large amount of androgen production. In this condition, polycystic ovary syndrome can result in excessive hairiness. That excessive hairiness on women is called hirsutism, and other signs of masculinization can occur. But in many cases, there's no clinical problem that's found, and hirsutism can just occur. There's also alopecia, which is the opposite of excessive hair growth. It's going to be hair thinning in both sexes after about the age of 40. There's also true or frank baldness which is genetically determined and sex influence. Male pattern baldness is more common than this type of baldness or frank baldness in women. And that would be caused by follicular responses to testosterone, essentially DHT, which is a type of androgen hormone similar to testosterone. There's also telogen effluvium or TE, and that's sudden hair thinning caused by an abundance of hair follicles entering resting phase at the same time. This is usually because of stress could be due to hormonal changes or surgery, all of which can cause stress, or even some severe emotional trauma or crash dieting, such as certain diets that have you restrict a certain biological molecule. Other causes or thinning and or texture change to hair could be caused by drugs, hypothyroidism, or protein deficient diets. All right, and then our next topic is going to be nails, so make sure you watch that video as well, and then make sure you go back and review what we've been through thus far.